All right, I found Studio B, put my vault down right here, and remember, go to Amazon, get beautiful vault beverage, unlock your brain. Now let's see if we can unlock your brain with the story of Binance. It's been in the headlines, there's a lot going on. Let me step back to the beginning. What is Binance, who founded it, and then what led to this huge headline we had about one of the largest fines in, in SEC DOJ history, along with a CEO now that has stepped down and is awaiting sentencing, sentencing meaning going to prison. Oh boy, you know, like Elizabeth Holmes and uh, SBF, we've had people behaving badly. Although this is the second one that's going to be in the crypto space, trading space that's uh, heading to prison, where SBF is undoubtedly going. Okay, Binance, where did it begin? It begins with founders, but where did those founders come from? They don't just parachute out of the sky and suddenly build a crypto company. You gotta have a lot of experience in other areas, or rather you should. Well, here's these two people. This is Cheng Peng Zhao, also known as CZ. Everybody calls him CZ, I will call him CZ. He had founded Fusion Systems, which was high frequency trading software. High frequency refers to lots and lots of trades, and it was trading software that worked for markets. And it says, Li He, which was the co-founder, she was the vice president at a technology company which was focused on mobile video, and they had both would eventually find a path together. And Binance was, what, the, what is Binance? Well, it's, a, it's basically a system operated a trading exchange, a cryptocurrency exchange where you could daily trade it. So think of it as the NYSE or the Amex, or, um, or the FTSE, you know, where you trade stocks and things, or Chicago Board of Options is an exchange where you trade. Binance was a trade for cryptocurrency. And those two people found each other. 2013, CZ was with Blockchain Info, and uh, he was working on cryptocurrency wallets, so he had some experience. Remember, this is a couple of years prior to being founded. Then he worked at OKCoin as the CTO, and he was actually hired there by Yee -hee. And in 2017, they founded Binance, but almost immediately moved servers in the company out of China because the government had real defined opinions on, on crypto. Many governments did, but China was a particularly hostile environment. So they actually moved everything supposedly to Japan. That was the first step. And then in 2018, CZ says, hey, let's get together and build a cryptocurrency trading exchange. And away they go. So she rewrote part of a white paper. A white paper is basically a position paper, a technical paper that describes things in detail about Bitcoin's initial coin offering they put together called the stable coin they had made. And again, the headquarters is there in Japan. I mean, Malta. So we'll get to that in a second. So you'll see that the sketchiness starts with where, where the heck was their, their headquarters and whatnot. So now then, they're up and running. Their market cap very quickly. Remember, from the point that they started to the point they were a billion a unicorn was not that long. And supposedly they'd moved the headquarters to Malta. And there was some discussion in Malta that said, well, we don't know if they're really authorized to be here. We don't, we're not really sure about that. And the Malta government actually made a statement at some point that said, ah, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know about this. Anyway, they make a flurry of announcements. We're partnering with these guys, partnering with those guys. But nonetheless, they were making profits, so they say big profits, giving people like you and me, if you wanted to get an account, to trade on Binance and to buy and sell cryptocurrency. They also announced Stablecoin. And Stablecoin was a coin that was supposedly going to be less volatile than Bitcoin by its nature and by its design. So nonetheless, they put all this together. Then in 2019, after all those announcements, all these things, hey, we got our exchange going, we're making a lot of money, we're doing this, we acquired this little tiny company, or maybe we didn't. There were a bunch of these sketchy announcements. Oh, we bought it for Bitcoin, and then we bought it for a little equity in us. And people are like, really? But So nonetheless, people are watching it, but it was blowing up. It was blowing up, and a lot of people were using it. Now we're about to find out who. Well, in 2019, they said, yeah, uh, we had a security breach. And hackers broke in and stole 7,000 Bitcoin, which at that time was worth $40 million. So they're barely off the ground. They're going. And despite having all that, he was the CTO at OKCoin. But for some reason, they didn't have a secure back end. So he was cornered and asked by the media, what the hell happened? How did 
freaking hackers steal 40 million in Bitcoin. And by the way, once you steal the Bitcoin, it's gone. You're invisible. It's hard to find you. That's the whole nature of cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. And so he said, and I will quote on this, uh, they used a variety of techniques, including phishing, viruses, and other attacks. Wait a minute. It's usually one or the other, but he's naming everything under the sun in a way that passed our security checks. Wait, a virus passes a security check. No, phishing emails is the things that pass security checks. So it was a real sketchy axer. And they halted further withdrawals and deposits at that time while they cleaned up the mess. And the mess being a lot of trust was lost and a lot of people were immediately pulling uh, the capital or the Bitcoin out of their accounts because they're like, yikes, if they got this much stolen, maybe mine can get stolen. So the wallets and people that, that had there, they were like, well, okay, I'm gonna pull them. So. This is going on 2019, 2020, 21. We have uh, the pandemic and COVID, and all of a sudden governments are seeing three years of this, sketchy acquisitions, issues going on, and we start to hear rumors that maybe these guys aren't filing suspicious activity reports or cooperating with governments, and we're hearing that drug dealers, terrorist organizations are using this, and when drug dealers, which usually are crossing from one country to another, smuggling drugs, terrorist organizations and others, people laundering money to avoid taxes, guess what? Governments turn their head and go, wait, wait, but what the hell's going on? And they weigh in. So check this out, 2021, United States, DOJ, Department of Justice, says, we think there's money laundering and tax offenses, meaning people are using Bitcoin to hide maybe profit they made over here, move it into Bitcoin, get paid in Bitcoin, hide it over here, convert it back to dollars, move it to another account somewhere. Ah, oh, I didn't pay any taxes on that. Government's like, wait a minute, you have to pay taxes on that. But now people had a way to shield it so that the government, the IRS, wouldn't get a, uh, a standard tax document um, from a transaction from some uh, banking or financial institution to say that you had some transactions that would be taxable. So suddenly the US is like, hey man, I'm good at taxing, I love taxing people, and now I can't, I can't find information on it, this is bad, I'm gonna investigate. The UK, the Financial Conduct Authority, which is similar to the Department of Justice and the IRS, they, they ordered, they said, stop. I don't care that you're an online thing. That website doesn't come here, and you have to stop all the regulated activity here in the UK. So that's a full haul. U.S. has said they're investigating. U.K. is saying, stop. Then, apparently, people found out that they shared client data, including names and addresses, with the Russian government. Because apparently the Russian government came up and said, what's going on here? Who's trading and when? And some things happened. And nonetheless, everybody freaks out. Wait, this is supposed to be private. So you cooperated and gave that to the Russian government, which caused the U.S. Department of Justice to say, wait a flipping minute, man. I wanted that information, too. What are you doing? Well, they didn't comply with reporting suspicious activity. If you have a brokerage account or a bank account and you walk in, and I'll give you an example. Several weeks ago, I sold a car. And... It was a kind of a classic car, so there's a lot of dollars involved. I go to the bank to deposit that, and they want to know, because it was more than 10000 a lot more than 10000 hey, where's this money coming from? I said, I just sold the vehicle. Do you have a copy of this, the form? I produced the Florida form that we filled out, and I showed them a copy of the title, because the guy that was there that was paying and transferring the money in, he's right there with me. Hey, it's this title right here, it was sold for this much, and this is the other guy. Okay, one of the C driver's licenses. We filled it all out. Then he said, okay, this is good. And so what is this? Well, we have to fill out these reports when more than $10,000 is transacted. And you could have sold a piece of art. You could have done something. Now, if that's being done with wires from a foreign bank over to here, and then I'm immediately the next day wiring it back, not only would they fill out that form, they would probably, my bank, would probably also file a suspicious activity report. What that tells is the IRS that says, hey, we're reporting it, we're not the cops, it's not our business what that money was used for or where it came from. We're just saying here's a suspicious activity report and the cops, the Department of Justice, you know, alcohol, tobacco and firearms, or the SEC starts sniffing around and saying, okay, well, let's find out where all that money came from. Sometimes it's very explainable. Maybe you bought a piece of art in Rome, had it shipped over here, wired the money back and forth. It's 50 grand and stuff. Well, now they're like, okay, that, I guess that's what you bought. 
Well, if you bought something once it comes in U.S. soil, depending on the state, they'll want you to pay sales tax even though you bought it over there. So these suspicious activity reports and commerce reports are important. And apparently Binance's compliance people were not filing them and not cooperating all the time. They would say sometimes with governments. So as you can see, that's not a good place to be. So 2021, suddenly 2023, the whip comes down, as they say, old Rolling Stones song. Here we go. SEC sues Binance and CEO CZ for U.S. security violations, June 5th. Then Binance mishandled funds and violated securities laws, according to SEC. Then U.S. regulator accuses Binance of running an illegal exchange. This is called, yo, in trouble, dude. You know, this is big. Well, how big? Well, now you see what was going on and people are like, oh my gosh, well, people are pulling money out of Binance, worried about it, but all this activity was still going on. At that point, you had U.S. senators coming to the microphone saying, we have a war in the U.K., war in the Ukraine, we have things going on, and we're worried that this money is being used, this exchange, Binance, is being used to give money to terrorist organizations, including people in the U.S. that might be suspicious folks that are trying to move that money to them to fund terrorist activities or money laundering or illegal sale of drugs. So once you build something like this, it can transport millions with relative privacy. You get the attention of people, well, that are moving millions of dollars of drugs and guns and would like some privacy from governments that would arrest them or in the case of, you know, wars might meet them on the battlefield and kill them. So the hammer comes down. What happens? What's the aftermath? Well, the U.S. government gives CZ a $50 million fine. He resigns as CEO and he's going to go to prison. And it would, they, uh, the sentencing hearing in February 2024. So the sentencing is going to be in a little under three months. Well, guess what? There was some uh, discussion and they have him held, I think it's a $175 million bond because they think he's a flight risk. Of course he's a flight risk. If this guy gets to Malta or some country, he's not coming back here. Okay, hey, I'm reporting for prison once he gets out. So they're like, nope, you got to stay here. They also gave the company a $4 billion fine. And boom, check it out. There's the headline. Then must stay in the U.S. for the time being. Yeah, it's called you're going to do prison time and we don't want you to scamper out around the world, find some deserted island where you can hide and, uh, you know, out in the Maldives or something. And then be like, well, hey, you didn't report for prison. Sorry, I forgot. You know. So now what's happening for the rest of the industry? You have had FTX and SBF, who is on his way to prison, and you've got this guy who now is, is going to be sentenced and almost certainly do some prison time, you know, coming up in February. And Coinbase, a company that's had some issues, but most of it, they've tried to play it square. Brian Armstrong, he's like saying, hey, I hope this means we've all turned the page and we need to have, we need to have speed limits on this highway and we all need to obey. So suddenly all the crypto buys and the exchange guys that were talking brash four years ago are now like, hey, speed limits are not a bad thing and we need regulation. Well, but he pushed back on saying, oh, I think it's, it's a little overblown. It's all being used for nefarious purposes such as money laundering, fraud and terrorist financing. Uh-huh. Fact is, a lot of crypto is. You gave, you gave the criminal activity around the world and people who are just dishonest white collar criminals ability to do this. And there's Mr. Brian Armstrong and there is CNBC's crypto world and these headlines are everywhere. So this is a big deal. So they all started out with um, blockchain technology and Bitcoin and crypto as a means to, you know, disrupt monetary systems on one hand, but on the other hand, they wanted to provide alternative methods uh, to pay for transactions, to buy and sell things. Nonetheless, you have FTX and Binance, two of the biggest, biggest crashes that you might imagine in terms of CEOs falling from grace, finding themselves in U.S. courtrooms with a lot of angry countries standing around saying, you know, we got to wrap these guys pretty hard and send them to prison. So what are the lessons for you and me? I talked a little bit about it. Some of you may be building businesses that are disruptors. And the first rule of disruption, disrupting an industry 
is not the same as disrupting a government. And when people talk about credit cards, transactions, you know, um, Bitcoin, you have to remember you could be disrupting things in a government that wants to be able to tax and regulate and control money in its economy. So people that are in fintech that think they're disrupting an industry, but they're really disrupting a government, your first rule of disruption, remember, boy, if you're disrupting the government or you're making a change, you better be playing clean, you know, because governments usually win. You know, fighting City Hall is not the same as fighting the DOJ and the IRS. So if you're disrupting in fintech, you got to be clean. You got to be in compliant. You could be making great things that help us. We didn't have PayPal. You know, we didn't have Square. There's so many wonderful tools that we got through fintech. However, there's also some disruptors out there that were coloring way outside the lines. You have the woman that tricked uh, JP Morgan Chase, sold a company to them and now they're suing her, and she's claiming, oh, no, no, it's the other way, you know, but um, she, she may not be going to prison, but she's in jail on basically selling a fintech prop, uh, product that I guess had some statistics in there about student loans and things that weren't quite correct, and, and JP Morgan thought the business was this, but the business was that, and they paid a bunch of money, and now they wanted their money back, and now they're suing her and everything. So if you're gonna disrupt, you got to play clean in this industry. So compete with clarity. Cooperate along the way. You can be brash. You can be disrupting. You can push back against the status quo and people that don't want you there. You can create new futures just as things like PayPal and Square and other things have done, but do it in the right way. Because if you're in, if you're in crypto and you're in Bitcoin and you're having alternative means and you're up against governments, if you upset those governments, those governments usually win. And that is the lessons for you and me and a quick case study of where Binance came from, from some people that knew what they were doing, had worked at OKCoin, had worked on wallets before, came together to build a trading exchange that would allow you and me to get on there and people around the world buy and sell and control and hold you know, crypto and at the end of the day, starting in China, moving there because that government had some rules, regulations to Japan, supposedly moving headquarters to Malta, operating a global co company and ultimately upsetting governments because they were allowing terrorists, drug dealers and tax cheats to move stuff around and avoid the governments. And those governments got pissed off. And now this guy sits here waiting to go to prison in the United States of America. That is the story of Binance. I'm gonna go back to the main studio, grab my vault, and wrap up.